by Black Podcast, episode 29. How to apply the concepts of leverage and mechanical advantage to community economics and your personal wealth building journey. Welcome to Buy Black, the only podcast dedicated to helping you find, connect with, and support black owned businesses. We're on a mission to bring consumers and business owners together to ignite the global black economy. I'm your host, Gerald Jones, and if you're a black business owner or a socially conscious consumer, you've joined the right community. Ready? Let's get to work. Welcome back to Buy Black, your only podcast dedicated to helping you find and connect with black owned businesses. Today, I want you to prepare to nerd out with me because I'm going to be discussing uh, a couple of concepts called leverage and mechanical advantage and uh you most definitely have heard of the term leverage as it's used when it comes to economics but you may not have actually heard the the other term mechanical advantage kind of flipped over and put into this context and so i'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about those two uh but before we do that i wanted to take a minute to share a couple of the new reviews that we have for the show from iTunes as well as the apps. I'm going to start over here at iTunes. We are now up to 15 five-star reviews on iTunes and the most recent one comes from Sunshine Mad and Steph, I know this is you. Thank you for jumping in and giving us this positive review for Bob Black Podcast. It reads, so much information. Seriously, listen to this show. Gerald brings so much information and knowledge. He brings so much to the podcasting world. Hey, Steph, thanks for being out there. Thanks for hosting me on your show twice now. That is the Mocha Minutes podcast. And for anybody who's listening over here with Buy Black, if you want to get a little bit of comedy and and, and a good conversation about uh, some social issues, entertainment issues, and, and even the uh, the Black Panther Review, which is the most recent episode of Mocha Minutes podcast I was on, then check out Stephanie's show. Uh, again, that is Mocha Minutes podcast. Um, yes, yeah, Steph, thanks so much for being out there. I want to jump over now to the app as well. You guys know that we have the app out on the store for you in Apple and in Android. And for those of the folks who have Apple products, I need y'all to watch out because the Android users are catching up very quickly. Uh, we're now up to 11 five-star ratings on the Apple app, and we have 10 five-star reviews that are on the Android app, even though it's only been out for just about two months now. So, hey, those of you who are out there with your Apple products, I need you to download the app. I need you to leave it a five-star review because you're quickly letting these Android folks catch up and take over. Uh, So we got two new reviews for the Android app. One comes from Paul Latibodere, and Paul actually hosted me on his show, Um, which is the Educated Hustle show. And so thanks, Paul, for being out there with Educated Hustle. This five-star rating that Paul left here says, the app is amazing. I'm able to keep up with the shows much easier this way. Gerald is really building a community that is essential to the Buy Black movement. Hey, thanks so much, Paul, for that feedback. And I am. I am all about trying to build this as a community. You guys hear me say it all the time. If we just come in and we listen to the show once a week, but we don't do anything with the information, we don't reach out to these businesses, we don't buy those products that we need from them, then this is all for naught. It's all about building that community, that network where we can build and grow together. Um, So I appreciate that you guys recognize that and that you're out there responding. And then um, we also got another new review. Now, this one is a four star review came in from Linda Walton Robinson. um, And it says, I love the podcast. However, it's not as convenient to listen through the app, but it is more appealing to view and to share. Hey, Linda, I really appreciate that feedback. And and for anybody out there, if you've got any feedback on how we can uh, try to make the app better, how we can make the experience better, then I'd love to get that feedback. And uh, and if you have any feedback that would make you say, hey, I'm not ready to give it a five star review, that doesn't mean don't leave a review. You know, I don't have any problem uh, checking out a review 
and seeing where we can do better. And hopefully we can earn that five stars down the line. But I appreciate the fact that, you know, you're, you're willing to give me some constructive feedback on how we can make the thing better for you. Linda, thank you for being out there. And for everybody else, thanks for being out there, giving us that feedback and engaging. I just love the fact that you guys are, are taking a few minutes of your time to let everybody else know what they can get from connecting with this podcast, connecting with this community, and keep it up. Keep doing that for us out there. So from that, I want to jump into today's topics. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, some pretty nerdy things. Uh, I'm going to talk about resources. I'm going to talk about levers, leverage, and the concept of mechanical advantage. Now, keep in mind, guys, that um, this is just me, a, a science nerd looking at some scientific terms and, and seeing how they apply to economics. And what I really want to do here is just kind of show how if you break down the terminology and you take a look at um, how the terms are normally used in the scientific world, and then you take a look at how we use them in the economic world, a lot of times uh, we strip the meaning from these words and we're not actually using them to the fullest of our advantage because we boil them down to just mean one thing or two things when we take these scientific concepts and we pull them over into economics. So what I want to do is I want to give the richness back to these ideas so that when we're thinking about uh, things like leverage, when we're thinking about things like resources, when it comes to trying to build wealth, that we're not thinking in this narrow stovepiped uh, mindset that, that we've all been given, that we've all been taught. And so um, nerd out with me a little bit today. We're going to go through some definitions. We're going to go through some examples. And, and hopefully what I want to achieve through this episode is I just want to open up your thinking. I want to open up the mindset so that uh, we, we go out from listening to this show and we're looking for examples of leverage in our environment around us. We're looking for examples of resources that we can use to build wealth, to build our businesses, things that we may have overlooked yesterday. You get done listening to this show, I want you to not overlook them tomorrow. All right. So with that, let's just jump straight into there are four things that I want to define just to get this show started. The first one is a resource. The second is going to be a lever. The third is going to be leverage. And then the fourth is going to be a mechanical advantage. So let's take a quick look at those. All right, so the first one, defining a resource according to the dictionary. A resource can be a source of supply or support. It can be a natural source of wealth or revenue. Or it could be a source of information or expertise. And I really want you to focus on the first and the third examples here. Because when we think resources, we typically think about, oh, well, there's there's water on this land or there's, you know, oil or minerals under the ground. These are resources, right? Think about natural resources or we think about money, right? We think about the resources that we have in the coffers to go out and spend money in order to try to grow our business. But we rarely think about resources in the context of a source of supply or support or a source of information or expertise. And if we're going to grow, if we're going to grow our businesses, we're going to grow our wealth, we need to start looking at resources as all the things around us that we can use for support and all the things around us that we can use for access to information or expertise. Because I know every single one of you out there is surrounded by people who are great sources of information, great sources of expertise, and great sources of support. And yet, in our community, a lot of times, um, we have this, um, this anxiety about asking for help. We have this anxiety about going to people and saying, hey, I need your support for this, or I need your support for that. We feel like we got to do it all on our own. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's not legit. And, and that's just crazy. Because we are the only group that seems to think like that, um, that seems to think if I don't make it on my own, then I didn't do it legitimately. You look at any other demographic, you look at any other group of people, the way that people build wealth, the way that companies build wealth, the way that, that, that any value is created out here in this world is by 
looking around and connecting with resources and getting support, getting expertise and growing with the help of others. So we need to start looking at our surroundings and our resources in that way. All right. Second definition here is the word lever, right? Because we hear leverage all the time. And typically we hear it in the terms of credit, right? When we're talking about economics. Um, but let's back it up to just what is a lever, right? So again, dictionary definition, a lever is a bar used to pry or dislodge something or an inducing or compelling force, a tool. Now, I like putting those two together and getting the imagery of those definitions in my head before I start thinking about them in economics. A bar used to pry or dislodge something or an inducing or compelling force, a tool. This is a lever. So when I look in my head and I see, you know, the idea of a bar used to pry or dislodge something, the very first thing that comes to my mind is like one of those old school um, you know, sealed cans, right? Like one of those big, huge sealed cans of like beans or something like that. And it's got the lid is like hammered into it. Um, and the only possible way that you're going to get that lid open is if you take something like a flathead screwdriver and you wedge it right there into the edge of that lid. And then you push down on the, uh, you know, on the arm of the screwdriver and it's just going to boop pop that lid right off, right? There's no way that without that tool, without that flathead screwdriver that you popped into the lid, that you were ever going to get that can open, right? You don't have the strength yourself within your fingertips, within your fingernails to dig under the edge of that can and actually pry it open. It's physically impossible, right? However, you take a tool, a very, very simple tool, and you just get a little bit of that under the lip. And all it takes is a tiny amount of pressure downward in order to pop it right open, right? That's the beauty of a lever. It is a tool that is used to enhance your own strength. It's a tool that's used to decrease the amount of energy that you've got to exert in order to get the proper amount of force to accomplish a goal, right? When we take the visual of that first part of the definition, a bar used to pry or dislodge something, and then you take the conceptual side of the other side of the definition and inducing or compelling force. And you think about this in terms of economics, you know, your own personal economics, a lever for you is anything, any resource that you can use that is going to decrease the amount of energy you need to expend in order to accomplish an economic goal. Anything, anything you can use that decreases your effort, your energy, and allows you to accomplish your goal. So we can see when we think about those definitions, how credit is most commonly the thing that is referred to when we talk about leverage when it comes to economics. Because if you don't have the money, you can borrow somebody else's money, put that money towards whatever your problem set is, whatever your, your project is, and then you can use somebody else's money in order for you to accomplish your goal. All right. So it's less out of your pocket because you're using somebody else's tools. You accomplish your goal. You give them their tools back with interest and you keep the rest. Right. This is this is a good thing. But what I would say to you today is that credit is not the only source of leverage. And that is why I want to have this episode, because I want us to think about more things that we have access to that can be used as leverage. And so speaking on that, let's move to that next definition, to the definition of leverage itself. So the first thing would be the action of a lever or the mechanical advantage gained by it. And the second one is the use of credit to enhance one's speculative capacity, right? So right there within that definition, straight from the dictionary, it recognizes, hey, we talk about leverage in the form of using credit in order to enhance your ability to build wealth. Um, however, 
Leverage is also the action of that lever or the mechanical advantage gained by it. And that's where that term mechanical advantage came in. That's why I wanted to talk about it as well, because that is very clearly a scientific term. Normally, we talk about mechanical advantage um, for most of us who aren't engineers and, and the like. Um, we talk about mechanical advantage in around the seventh or eighth grade when we do physical science, and then we never talk about it again. But it's great to talk about it in these terms, because if you look at the two main places where we hear about mechanical advantage, it's going to be in pulley systems and it's going to be in, in lever systems, because those are both designed to do very similar things, right? A pulley system is something where you basically, you've got a rope of some sort and it's going through a system of pulleys and the more of those pulleys that you have between you, the person exerting the force, and then whatever the object is that you're trying to lift and pull off the ground, the less effort you're going to have to put in in order to get that weight or that object off of the ground. All right. So with with one single pulley, the amount of you know pressure that you have to put on one side of the rope, on one side of the pulley in order to get the other thing off the ground is basically going to have to be a one for one. But when you add in pulleys in between, all of that force gets distributed to such a point where you can put less energy into it on one side and you can accomplish the goal that you're looking for on the other side because all of that weight, all of that, the energy that is required is getting distributed across those pulleys. So it's not all just on you, right? And so the idea of mechanical advantage is um, the, the additional advantage that you get from each additional layer of pulleys or levers that you use to accomplish this goal, right? Um, so, and I hope I'm explaining this right, uh, nerds out there. If you if you want to correct me, please, you know, write in, jump into the Facebook group, have a conversation about it. Um, but I'm trying to keep it simple and not talk too much technical terms on this. So. Um, Mechanical advantage. So if I start off with a single, let's call this a pulley, right? And I've got a rope, I've got a object on one side, I've got me on the other side, and the rope just goes over the top of one pulley system. And so I'm pulling down on that one pulley, right? On that rope over that one pulley. I've got to put out 100% of the amount of force that would match the weight of the object on the other side to get that object lifted off the ground, right? And so I have no mechanical advantage really from that pulley. I'm at a one to one ratio. However, if we add a pulley to that and I've got the rope is connected on one end to me, and then it goes over one pulley and then it goes down under, and then it goes up over another pulley. And now I'm pulling on this rope and it's, circling through multiple different pulleys, then as I'm pulling on that rope, there is less energy that I have to exert in order to get the object on the other side to come off the ground, right? And so however much additional energy I save in order to accomplish that same job with each additional pulley that I add, that is the ratio of my mechanical advantage. So I can get a two to one, a three to one, a four to one, a five to one uh, advantage, which basically just means I'm putting out way less effort to get the same amount of work done, right? That is what mechanical advantage is. And it works in pulley systems. It also works with lever systems because with, with leverage, the, the thing that you look at is I'm having to put a certain amount of force, downward force onto the object in order to pry or dislodge this thing. Well, when I stack my levers on top of each other, I have to put less force onto that object in order to make it work. The greatest example of this that I can give you that you use regularly, I guarantee every single one of you uses this regularly, is a set of fingernail clippers, right? Think about a set of fingernail, uh, fingernail clippers. What do you got? You basically have two pieces of metal 
that you want to squeeze together with enough force to clip your fingernail clean off. Now, if you take that top piece of metal off of it and you just have the two pieces of metal connected and you try to squeeze them together with your thumb and your forefinger, you can do it, but that is a lot of work. And it's probably not going to exert the amount of force required in order for you to actually clip your fingernail, right? You can squeeze down on it, but it's not going to actually clip through. But when you look at the way that a fingernail clipper is designed, you've got the two pieces of metal that are connected right to the sharp wedge. And then right in the middle of it, you've got a nice little, mm, I don't know what you call this thing, but it's that little bar. And then connected to that bar, you've got a third piece of metal that goes straight through the middle of it. And it's at an angle to your top bar, your top piece of metal. You guys know what I'm talking about right now, right? I'm trying to explain it in a simple way. But when you press down on the third piece, it doesn't take very much energy at all to push down and connect these two pieces of metal that are then going to clip your fingernail. Not a whole lot of energy at all. Why? Because you have a compound lever there, right? You have a lever that is used in conjunction with another lever in order for you to exert the force required to get the job done, right? Now, I know that's a, that's a pretty long explanation of how levers work, how leverage works, and what mechanical advantage is, but it's really important especially the mechanical advantage part, because um, even though the, that term mechanical advantage, it really is intended to be scientific, right? You, you have the, the mechanism that you're using is giving you a, an advantage, right? But when we turn this over into the world of economics and economic achievement, right? And career achievement and any, any kind of achievement in life, it ties directly to this this whole concept that I'm sure that every single one of us at some point in our lives has had somebody come to us and say, hey, I need you to start working smarter, not harder, right? Anybody who's had any decent mentor at any point in their life has been told, work smarter, not harder. But what does that really mean? Well, let's start off with the, the whole work harder mindset. That's where I have a problem because we in the black community are told throughout our entire lives this uh, this defeatist idea of we got to work twice as hard to achieve half as much. Now, that is true, right? That is true. We do have to work twice as hard to achieve half as much. However, normally, that's the end of the conversation, right? Somebody says that people start nodding and humming like we in church. And then it's just like a, yep. And that's the reason why we're where we're at. But I'm not good with that. I'm not good with just leaving it at, yep, we're at a disadvantage. So work hard, young man. No, I, I don't like that. I can tell you right now, me as a individual, anybody out here listening who went to high school with me or went to junior high or elementary school with me can tell you straight up, I am not all about that hard work stuff, right? I just, I'm, I don't feel it because working harder never made a person wealthy. It never made a person free. Um, I know for me, the example that I had growing up, you know, my dad, my dad was one of the hardest working people I have ever seen in my life. He managed fast food restaurants for most of my childhood. And then later on, he managed to um, to become the national sales manager for a, uh, a pretty big uh, hair care company. And he did that for a while. Um, he those were the two main things that he did mainly is fast food. And then he did the national sales manager thing for the for the hair care company. Um, but when my father passed, he he didn't have anything to leave me. Um and I'm an only child, so you know it would have been would have been to me. But he he didn't accumulate anything in his life um, aside from from debt and a lot a lot of friends. He he had a lot of friends. He took care of a lot of people. He was a really hardworking guy. He was a great guy. Um, but all of his hard work 
didn't help him amass any wealth, anything that he could pass on to the next generation. And so I'm not about let's just work harder. Let's understand that we have to work twice as hard so we can achieve half as much. To me, that logic leaves me at best, you know, half as far ahead in life as the next group. And if I wanted to keep up with them, then that means I'd have to work four times as hard as them, right? And that's just not sustainable for me to go around working four times as hard as everybody else in order for me to just barely break even. There's just no long-term benefit to that, right? And so if we just keep the mindset of we work twice as hard to achieve half as much and, you know, go out and get your straight A's in school and get your bachelor's degree and your master's degree and your PhD, and then eventually maybe somebody will look at you and say, oh, I guess I'll listen to this black person. I, I just, I'm not feeling that. I'm not all about going out to prove my worth by working my butt off to get a whole bunch of letters to put behind my name just so somebody will look and say, oh, I guess I'll have to listen to him. No doesn't work for me. I would prefer to work smarter. And to me, working smarter is recognizing the value of leverage and resources in my life. I think the way that you can work smarter, the way that you can achieve your goals in life is to focus on all of the resources and all of the opportunities for leverage that are around you in your life, and then to use those, right? Because if I get a mechanical advantage from the use of a lever in my economic journey, and I can get an even higher mechanical advantage when I stack levers on top of each other, then the smartest way for me to work to build wealth is for me to look at all the tools and all the resources around me and figure out how can I stack them so that they are doing the work for me and I can achieve my goals with less effort. That's the way that you build wealth. And if you look at any other demographic, like I said earlier, that's the way they've all built wealth. Community economics is not about we'll go buy black and only buy black and don't buy from anybody else, and don't interact with anybody else. No, it is not at all. It is about building relationships everywhere around you with people across multiple different demographics, with people with multiple different um, value sets that they can bring to you, expertise and information they can bring to you, access to different media that they can bring to you, and then you use those resources in order to lift you up to the next level and bringing those resources into the black community to help lift our community up to the next level. So it's not about shutting us off from the rest of the world. We do that. We're never going to be able to catch up because we don't have enough resources in our community in order to do it all on our own at this point. No, we go out, we find out where are the resources we can use, and then we leverage those resources in order to bring more wealth into the community, right? And those resources are all around us. They're always there. So I want to go through a few examples of resources that are available that can be used as leverage. Now, the first one, of course, is credit. Credit is a problem in our community because we don't all have great credit, right? So so going to a traditional bank in order to get money to borrow isn't always available to us as new business owners. Um, but you might be able to go to a Black-owned bank if you live in an area where you can find a Black-owned bank. You might have relatives who can loan you a small amount of money in order for you to get started in business, and then you get that money back to them. There's multiple different ways to get access to credit, regardless of what your credit score is. The key, though, in this is understanding what credit is for. Credit isn't for going out and getting the car that everybody else is going to look at and say, that's a nice car, but that car is constantly depreciating in value. And you're not even using that car for your business. You're just using that car so that everybody can see you in it, right? Credit is not for going out and getting a new wardrobe every other week. 
in some new clothes that you're going to wear once, throw inside the closet, and then never wear again. Because those aren't resources. You know, that car that you're not using for your business is not a resource. Those clothes that you're not using for your business are not resources. And so you are not leveraging credit. You're wasting it, right? You're wasting somebody else's money. And then you're wasting your money because you got to pay them back what you owe them plus interest. That's not the right way to use credit. If you understand that credit is there for you to level up, to leverage in order for you to move to a better situation, then no matter where you have to go to get that credit, whether it's to family, whether it's to a, a, a credit and loan location in the community, whether it is from an actual you know bank, as long as you look at it and say, I'm using this in order to get from this level to the next and then I'm going to pay them back. I'm going to keep what I made. And then I'm going to use that in order to grow to the next level. Nothing wrong with credit if you're using it the proper way as leverage. All right. Some other examples of leverage that have that we have access to. There are grant programs and scholarship programs that are designed specifically for minority communities, the black community. They can be in business. They can be in education, whatever they are. Any grant program that exists out there, any scholarship program that exists out there, that is a resource that is designed to provide leverage to you. And so we have to look at them like that. We have to look and say, what grants do I qualify for? What scholarships might I qualify for that are going to help me get access to something that I would not have had access to on my own, that I would not have been able to achieve on my own? Let me take advantage of that resource. Uh, professional networks, huge. Along with that, fraternities and sororities, huge resources that you can use for leverage. So joining professional networks to do more than just kind of go out there and hand out business cards and tell people, you know, this is what I do for a living. Um, but actually joining those professional networks to build relationships, joining fraternities and sororities to build relationships, to find resources, people who've already been there, done that, who can teach you how to avoid the pitfalls, who can sometimes walk you straight up that ladder to success and basically keep you from wasting a bunch of time and energy trying to figure it out on your own. Those are massive resources, tools that you can use in order to leverage and be a success. Um, other things that you can use for leverage, if you want to start a business and you've got the expertise, but you don't have uh, the technical capability to build whatever it is, hey, you can partner with somebody. You know, if I've got the expertise in the industry, but you know how to code, we can partner up and I can tell you how to build this app. You can build that app. We go in and we take our app to market. And guess what? Now we're both making money, right? So a partnership with somebody who's bringing to the table a set of skills that you don't already have, that's the way you can use leverage to achieve. Uh, another one here, you see this one a lot in, in the project management world. Uh, you see this one a lot in the corporate world. Um, they say that you need to find a champion, right? Find a champion. Now, if you're not familiar with that terminology, what that means is, um, if you're dealing with somebody in an organization, if you're dealing with an organization and in that organization, you've got politics, you've got leadership, you've got all of these different tiers of people that you've got to go through in order to get anything done. And you want to get resources for your project. You need to find a champion. That champion is somebody who's high enough in the organization that people have to listen to them. And it's somebody who truly believes in your project. They believe in your idea. They believe that it can work. They believe in the value that it's going to bring. And they have the ability to make other people act based on what it is that they believe. That's a champion. If you want to be successful, you've got to be able to look around you and find where is my champion? Where is the person who believes in me and who can influence other people so that they will believe in me? And that doesn't just have to be in the corporate world. I'll give you a great example all right, in my world. Um, so I, I work in, in the consulting field, right? I, I consult with the government. And one of the things that I do is, is training development, is training evaluation, and, um, and instructional design. 
right? And, and I teach people as well. So um, in order for me to do that job better, a few years back, I went to a certification course. Um, I, I got a bronze level certification in training evaluation from uh, from this company. And and I'm not going to you know put the company's name out there because I, um, I work with them now, but I, that's where I'm kind of getting to. Uh, I got this bronze level certification and I immediately went and I took what I learned and I used it to improve the product that I was doing, um, that I was giving to my client at the time. Well, a couple of years later, I have the opportunity to get a silver level certification um, with this same uh, organization. And, and this time, the person who came out to teach it was actually the owner of the company, right? Like, like last name on the name uh, of the company, last name of the guy teaching the class, right? So when he came out to teach his class, I, I said, hey, so here's a bunch of stuff that I did after I took your class a couple years ago. And um, I just want you to look it over. Tell me what you think about it. Well, uh, we talk and he's very impressed. He wants me to come in and, and talk to another bronze level class that he's given and kind of give them my story. So I do that. And then he reaches out to me and says, hey, so I want you to come to this training conference with uh, with us and I want you to share your story with the folks we're going to be teaching at this conference. It was a conference to Disney World and I'm like, oh, heck yes. Thank you. Um, but during that time, in the, in the several months between when we first met to when I went to this training conference, I made up my mind, hey, eventually I want to be able to go out on my own and have my own company and have my own uh, reputation in this training world. And I want to have my own consulting business, right? But how do you build a reputation in, in such a huge market in a huge world? How am I going to stand out? It's like, well, first I need to learn from somebody who's already done it. Right. And I want to learn from, from this guy because, uh, his name is, is well known across the training industry. And if I can impress him, if I can show him that I've got what it takes to connect with people, to solve people's problems and to to be an asset to the training industry, then he will use his name to promote me. So when I go to this conference, I'm going to make sure that I get a chance to sit down with him and um, and his partner and. I'm going to pitch to them that I want to become a certified facilitator for their product. And I want to go out and I want to teach people the certification course for their product so that I can help them. And I told them, it's like, I eventually want to run my own business and I want to learn from you how I can do that. Um, I found my champion. This is a person who, if I impress them, they will impress upon others how important it is to work with me because they know the value that I bring. And so that's exactly what I did. I went to the conference. Uh, I, I did what I felt was a great job, asked if we could sit down, have lunch together. And I, I pitched to him, hey, this is something I'd like to do. Within a couple of months, I was certified to teach their course. And then over the last year or so, that's a secondary job that I have. Go out as an independent contractor. I teach their course to folks who are out at, at different locations. And uh, all the while, I'm listening and I'm learning and I'm connecting. And I'm growing this personal relationship with a titan in the training industry. So I know 100% that when I'm ready to go out and leave the company that I'm at now, start my own company, that is doing performance uh, consulting, training consulting, I'm going to be able to go over and say, hey, I'm launching my business. Can you help me get my foot in the door with some of the companies that may be a little bit too small for your business, but could definitely use my business, right? Be a client for me. That's how you get a champion, right? That's, that's leverage right there. Because when I do step out to run my own company, I'm not going to have to go out there and spend a whole bunch of advertising dollars in order for me to get my face in front of people or, you know, go running around to networking events left and right in order to try to get my name in front of people. My name is already golden with somebody who everybody in the industry already trusts. 
So all I'm going to have to do is go to my champion and say, hey, I'm ready to step out here into this world. Help me get off the ground. And that's it. That's a champion, right? And you can do that in your corporate world. You can find those people in your personal life. You can find those people in your professional networks. Uh, but it just it needs to be somebody whose reputation is already unassailable and who has the influence themselves such that whenever they speak, people listen, people take it seriously, and people act. Find those champions that will help you leverage your personal and professional life. And then the last thing here, when we talk about sources of leverage, this is the one that is overlooked most often. Very frustrating for me. Your job. Your number one source of leverage is your job. The paycheck that you get every week or two weeks or every month. That is your biggest source of leverage. Because when you look at the goals that you want to achieve, right? If you have a goal of starting a business, so many people think they can't start a business because they've got to quit the job that they have. Oh, you need to have six months of income in the bank and you need to do this and you need to do that. And you got to have all these things and those things and blah, 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 blah. You know what? If you're going to start a certain type of business, yeah, you'll have to quit. You'll have to quit your other business before you can do that. But we are in 2018. Not every business requires you to go out and get a lease on an office space and buy desks and computers and go out and spend a bunch of advertising money to get on TV and radio to get your first clients and, you know, spend all this time and money and energy trying to do that and hiring people and all of this crap. Right. This is not 1992 anymore. This is not 1976 anymore. There are so many different ways to start a business. And you've heard me talk about this before. And a lot of them don't take a lot of money and they don't take a lot of time, but they can turn you a profit. So if you look at your job as leverage to get that business started, whatever that business is, low barrier to entry, low cost business with a high profit potential, you figure out how much money do I need to put aside to start that business, and then you leverage your paycheck. Yep, I'm going to pay myself first. I'm going to put a certain amount of money aside each month to go into my business fund. And then once I have my business fund built up, I can start my business, I can start running my business, and I still have my job and my paycheck over here paying the monthly bills. So I've leveraged the job that I didn't quit, that I'm not going to quit, that I'm still going to be giving 100% of my, my interest to in that eight hours a day every day, you know, 40 hours a week. But when I'm away from that 40 hours, I'm going to spend some of my time growing my own business and building my own profits. And then once those profits reach a point where I no longer need the job, now I can leave the job, right? But you don't just quit everything and then go out and start a business from scratch with no leverage, with no client base, with no champions, with no credit, with no professional networks. All of those things you build such that when you're ready to leave your job, you already have all these other things in place. You can just step out and be a success because you've already built everything. And you didn't build it. Your resources built it. They helped you build it. So your level of energy that you had to put into building all of that was much lower because you had resources that you leveraged to help you grow along the way. And you had a job that you leveraged to make sure that all of your bills were paid for and taken care of while you were building this other thing for yourself over here. There's nothing wrong with working smarter, not harder, using that leverage. So the last thing that I want to do tonight is quickly give you some examples of leverage from episodes of this show that we've already had. And I'm not going to be able to hit on all of them, uh, but I'll just give you a couple of quick examples of how people have used leverage and explain that in the episodes that we've done here. I'll start with, you know, episode number three, a talk with Nika Brown Massey about innovative supplies worldwide. And she started her business using leverage from programs that were available for military members who were separating and wanted to go out and start their own business, right? So she used veteran-owned business resources 
that were available to help her get her business off of the ground. Didn't go out there and try to figure it all out on her own. Said, hey, there is a group here that is designed to help me get this thing going, help me avoid the pitfalls, help me to learn things and get me access to more resources. I'm going to go to them. I'm going to use them. I'm going to learn it from them. This is one of those tools. Here's another example of leverage from that same episode from the same business owner. So Nika was creating school supplies with positive images of black culture on them. Well, where did she get those images from? Well, she went to Instagram, which is a platform where people share images. And she connected with black artists who were on Instagram, whose art that she liked. And she licensed the art from them in order to put onto her school supplies. That's another example of leverage. Now, she could have gone out into her community and tried to attend every art showing and go to every art museum and go to the small little, you know, um, you know, art houses that someone may or may not have had a um, some images that she could use. You know, that's a lot of work. It would take a lot of time. And, it, and she would only be able to access folks who were right there in her community in Georgia. But instead, there was a platform that somebody else already built. It was a resource that already existed that has literally millions of people on it, probably hundreds of thousands of black artists who were on there trying to share their work, trying to get it noticed. And she leveraged that tool to find the right resources to get her business started and get some incredible art for her business. That's a great example of leverage, right? Another example here, uh, Jamel LaBranch, if you remember episode 19, Jamel LaBranch has uh, Faith is Fuel Shades. And in his episode, he talked about how he leverages influencers in order to grow his brand, right? So Jamel also used Instagram and he's got these incredibly stylish uh, sunglasses. They're expensive sunglasses and they're worth every penny of it. And instead of going out and trying to, you know, hawk his sunglasses at a local expo or something like that, uh, what he does is he'll just take a couple of images of some of his shades and he will just send them to the inbox of an, um, an athlete or celebrity someone who's known to be fashion forward who may be interested in that product. And so he puts his product in front of the people that other people are watching. And yeah, not every single one of them is going to respond. Not every one of them is going to to jump on his product. But the ones who have, now they become first movers. Now they become influencers. And so now his product is on, on the face of somebody who has thousands of people who are following and listening to this person. So they are helping him position his brand as a luxury item without him having to go out and spend a crap load of money on a bunch of advertising to try to create this campaign that puts his brand in the light that he wants. He gets it in the hands of the people who are influencers. They talk his brand up. They wear his brand. Their followers start wearing his brand. And next thing you know, he's got a luxury sunglass brand without having to put in a whole lot of work. That's leverage. And it's brilliant. Next example, Rashida Hawthorne, episode 22. You guys remember Rashida started a dropshipping business. And I've had a lot of feedback on that dropshipping business episode. Dropshipping is so great because the only thing you really have to spend money on is getting a simple online store website set up and getting a connection with a manufacturer of a product such that whenever somebody buys the product from you, you send the money to the manufacturer and that manufacturer ships the product directly to the customer. You never own the product in between. So by never having to own the inventory, all of that risk is gone. All of the money that you would have to shell out up front to get inventory into your own Um, into your own storage, into your own warehouse or your home, wherever you would keep it, all that money doesn't have to be there. All you need is a simple website and a relationship. Somebody else is taking on all the responsibility and all the risk of that inventory. So a dropshipping business is a huge leveraging opportunity 
And Rashida Hawthorne explained to us exactly how you can use that leverage and opportunity in order to start a profitable business without putting a lot of money down. Furthermore, she used the profits from that first business and leveraged those to start her second private label business with Glambo. Again, the use of leverage. You guys are seeing over and over again how how often that terminology shows up in the way that successful people actually grow their businesses. Nobody does it through super hard work. Yeah, you got to work hard, but you're never going to grow a massive business by putting a crap load of energy and effort and work into your business. You spend a whole lot more of your time and energy figuring out what the resources are and what levers you can put in place in order to multiply the um, the effect of the energy that you put in. You're going to be a lot more successful. All right. A couple other quick ones. DJ Reese. He talked about how he leverages relationships with people who are in complementary businesses to grow his client base. So he's a mobile DJ. He's got friends who own restaurants where people have birthday parties all the time. He's got friends who are photographers and videographers who, who go out to events all the time. And you connect with those people, again, your professional network. And those folks have clients and those clients might need your business. Hey, those relationships can be used as leverage. Uh, John Thomas, he talked about leveraging the income from his day job to buy his first property and get into the real estate business, right? He got a bonus. That bonus could have been used to go out and buy himself a nice, pretty new car. But no, he went out, he bought a quadplex, moved into it, rented out three of the other um, apartments inside of it and let his tenants pay his rent or pay his mortgage. Guess what? Leverage twice. He leveraged his bonus to get the quadplex, and then he leveraged the rental income to pay his mortgage. It's all about working smarter, not harder. Last one here, Jared Woodley. We talked to Jared just last week, right? Um, so Jared has been in the real estate business now for uh, about 15 years right? And he's just started doing the raw land business. Now, he had never done raw land before. He could very easily have just gone and said, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to read everything that there is to read about flipping raw land, and then I'll figure it all out on my own. Or he could do what he did. He found a company, the Land Academy, who already had an entire process set up for flipping land. They already have relationships with the with the databases where you can actually get the information that you need to send out offers to people who own this land. He went through a company that already had the information and the expertise available. He paid them a little bit of money to get access to their information and their expertise so that he could save himself the time and the energy. And then he could just jump straight in and start running the business, making money. And if he had any questions, he could just reach out to the experts. That is leverage, guys. It's that simple. And it's all around us. That's really the point of this entire episode. We need to think about resources and leverage in the context that they actually exist. The tools and the resources are all around us, always available to us. It's just that we don't think about them in the right context. So hopefully, having listened to this episode, it's going to change the way that you look at the people around you. It's going to change the way that you look at the businesses around you and, and change the way that you look at your opportunities to build and grow your own things, not through your own hard work. Yes, you're going to work hard, I'm not saying that you won't, but not through your own labor, not through your hard work, but through leveraging the work that somebody else has already done or the expertise that somebody else has already gained or the access to an audience that somebody else has already built. And you just need to step in and take advantage of that. And we say take advantage Understand that the underlying subtext of all of this is that you're doing this ethically, right? You're building relationships with the people who are helping you to grow, who are being that leverage for you, and you're offering them your services. You're offering them your support in, other, in whatever way that you can. It always needs to be a two-way street, but that is networking. That is, that is life blood. 
you find all of those people and all of those uh, resources that are around and available to you and you build relationships with them. You find out what it is that they need that you can offer. You find out what it is that you need that they can offer. And then don't be afraid to ask for that support. Don't be afraid to use what it is that they can offer in order to take the load off of yourself to accomplish your goals. That is how wealth is built. And if you run into the pushback that we get a lot in our community, if you run into that rugged individualism that I did it all on my own, you know, that that whole thing, man, don't get frustrated by it. You just got to let those people go. They're not meant to be a part of your network. There are some folks who want to go out and they want to just be the lone wolf. And you know what? You just let them be. Don't get frustrated by it. Don't argue with them about it. Just keep it moving. Because if you're going to build your own community, if you're going to build your own resource network that you're going to be able to leverage to go all the way to the top of your economic goals, you won't be able to spend any time wallowing with the folks who don't see the vision, who don't understand how important community is, who aren't going to be a part of our communal solution to our economic problems that we have in the black community. Talk to them, try to connect with them. Hey, if they're not on it, let them go, move on to the next, because eventually they'll see, or they won't, what we're building over here, what you're building over there, and they'll come back and they'll be ready to join up. But don't get frustrated for the ones that aren't. Spend your time and energy on the ones that are or who do want to support. All right. So we're going to get out of here today with a final call to action. What I want you to do is I want you to start looking for examples of leverage in your own surroundings. Just like I gave you some examples of leverage from previous episodes in the show. Um, Look for the folks around you and, and see how is this person using leverage to accomplish their goal? You know, what could I do? to help them accomplish their goal? How could they use me as leverage, right? And make those offers and vice versa. Find out how they can help you accomplish your goals. Start thinking about everything in terms of resources and leverage and build that portfolio of relationships around you, of folks who you are helping to achieve their goals and decrease the amount of energy they have to expend and vice versa. And finally, If you want to have a conversation about leverage, if you want to share with us how it is that you are using leverage to accomplish your goals, or even more importantly, if you want to connect with folks in this community to start providing leverage to each other, I want you to go on over to Buy Black Podcast Community Facebook group, join that group and start connecting, start communicating with folks who are already in the group and start building those relationships right there within our own community so that we can leverage each other so that we can continue to keep growing. All right. That is our show for tonight, guys. I hope that it wasn't too convoluted uh, going into this nerdy stuff about leverage and mechanical advantage and all of these wonderful things. But um, I told you all a while back, I nerd out sometimes and today was one of the nerd out shows. So I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful for you and we will catch you in the next episode. 